His skin is white just like a ghost Thick Irish roots and his blonde hair And he sounds like a Chicago super fan A music nerd with a collection Of CDs from here to there Yes, Andy Dare is in Chicago Interviewing and barbecuing It's the end gang, welcome to the 80th episode of the Andy Dare Show. I'm your host, Andy Dare. Um, wow, we got a great one this week. We've got Stephen Droz from the Flaming Lips. Been a longtime fan, um, almost 20 years now. I've been listening to the guys from Oklahoma City. Um, they got their really own style of originality that they bring to all sorts of styles of music. But uh, yeah, there's not many bands in the last 20 years, especially American bands, that have stayed, uh, you know, daring and uh, taking these chances and doing doing stuff that's outside of the box. Um, can't think of any more American band that's been as original as the Flaming Lips. And it was a pleasure as usual. Want to thank all the listeners, sponsors, and guests for making this an awesome last 80 shows. And it's only going to continue. Got a lot of big things coming up on the horizon. But before we get into that, I need to get into my awesome sponsors. First up, we got Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue in gorgeous Westmont, Illinois. They are the real deal barbecue, family-friendly restaurant, and full-service catering company. Give them a call at 630-493-9000. Visit them at 132 South Cass Avenue in Westmont, Illinois, and check them out on the web at UncleBubs.com. As far as the catering, um, they are taking orders right now, and they are filling up for the summer already. And uh, if you didn't know, they do pig roasts, luau's, corporate lunches, picnics, backyard barbecues, whatever you want. They can bring out a whole you know, staff. They can bring a... Uh, a pig roaster, they can bring a grill. Make sure that your party goes off without a hitch. Order Uncle Bub's Catering today and tell them the Andy Dare Show spent, sent you for specials and offers. And by Secondhand Mall. Also located in gorgeous Westmont, Illinois. I'm keeping my sponsors local. That's a good thing. If you're a fan of this show, you know that my record store of 28 years, Remember When Records, recently the owner retired and sold off all the inventory to Secondhand Mall, and now they have an incredible vinyl selection. It's called Record Utopia, run by a real nice guy named Dan who's very knowledgeable, Um, but they buy, sell, trade, all sorts of good stuff. Besides the vinyl, they have, you know, computer equipment, they have power tools, they have vintage music gear as well. Um, for the musician in you, whole bunch of cool stuff, great atmosphere, nice guys. Check them out at 309 West Ogden Avenue in Westmont, Illinois. Give them a call at 630-810-9980. And uh, as I said, they buy, sell, trade. So if you uh, want to turn that stack of CDs in your closet into a little bit of spending money, why not hit up Second Hand Mall? And check them out on the web. That's 2ndhandmall.com. And tell them the Andy Dare Show sent you. And by Amazon. We are now an Amazon affiliate. All you got to do is click on the AndyDareShow.com. Click on the banner on the right-hand side of the page. You shop at Amazon like you normally would, and you spend uh, zero extra dollars, zero extra cents supporting the Andy Dare Show. It's a tip of the hat and a, and a wink of the eye to the Andy Dare Show. It means a lot. We've found a really whole bunch of cool stuff being purchased on Amazon through our banner, and it really means a lot. 80 episodes in that you guys are still clicking on the banner. It means a lot to me. Okay, and this episode is also underwritten by a different company. We've got MakeYourFortune.com. Okay, Empower Network shares a story of inspiration and freedom, identifying a message of thought-provoking action on telling others about self-empowering mastery and creating automated wealth funnels for lifestyle design and abundance, creating sincere value and promoting leadership inside a like-minded community. Find them at www.make-your-fortune.com. 
All right, that about does it for the sponsors. Thanks for sticking through them. Thank you to the sponsors for help underwriting the Andy Dare Show. And, yeah, so we got a great one with Stephen Droz this week. I remember um, riding my bike to get their album. Um, it was the Soft Bulletin in Summer 99. And uh, later that day, I got arrested for launching water balloons at our middle school. And uh, it was good memory, good time, and I was glad I had that cool record to come home to after I uh, had been grounded. But anyways, a lot of great memories with the Flaming Lips. I think my first television appearance seeing them was Spring Break 95, and it was cool. I was uh, visiting a friend in Iowa, and we were just sitting around in his room. We were in fifth grade, and obviously turning into MTV Spring Break because at that point in time, in 1995, MTV was a tastemaker. It was cutting edge. It was often brilliant. It was bringing all sorts of alternative and new forms of music to the public. And in turn, the public was eating it up with a spoon. Um, yeah, so we were watching the spring break, and uh, it was Van Halen, uh, you know, Van Hager at the time. Hager was fronting Van Halen. And they were kind of seeming like rock dinosaurs at the time. You know, talking about tequila and wabo wabo or whatever, cabo wabo and stuff. But the Flaming Lips took the stage and were totally different, totally unique, charming, yet uh, kind of strange at the same time. It was a great show, and I uh, knew at that point I would be checking out the Flaming Lips. So now you fast forward, what, 17, 18 years, and I'm interviewing one of them. It uh, means a lot that I can still do this show 80 episodes in. It means a lot that I'm still getting cool guests, that you guys are still checking it out, and we're able to bring you this content week after week. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to my 80th episode with special guest Stephen Drove. Everybody, thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. I am here with Stephen Droz of the Flaming Lips. How you doing, Stephen? I'm very good. You said my last name correctly. That makes me that makes me very happy. That's great. Good to hear. Um, how, how goes your Monday so far? Um, a little hectic, you know. Usually, I on Mondays I get to just kind of, you know, sit around at least in the morning time. But today is one of those days where, you know, I'm just a human being. I have to go get the car serviced. And then I have to come home and meet this plumber who's doing something with the toilet downstairs. So, you know, I'm just a, just a dude at home dealing with the reality. So, yeah, but I'm good. And you're still out in Oklahoma City, correct? You're... Yes, sir. I'm in, I'm in Oklahoma City, yes. And that's for life, right? You you grew up there, right? Well, I grew up um, all around Houston, mostly Houston, Texas. And then, long story short, I moved to Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma in 91 and met the Lips guys. And I've been here. Ever since, I lived in uh, upstate New York or western New York for a couple of years, but now I'm back in Oklahoma City, and I think my wife and I and two kids, we just want to stay here for, for the rest of our lives because, you know, it's getting better all the time. Oklahoma City is always improving, so yeah. I feel like the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, must have helped out the city itself. Did you guys notice a difference after they came? Or? Oh, my God. It's it's just it's a such a jolt for the whole city, you know, because – you know, for years downtown and Bricktown, all that stuff, it was just kind of no man's land. But yeah. since the since the thunder moved in, there's just been this big resurgence of of energy in the city. And I went to I took my son to our first game just Wednesday night. We went to our first game finally, and uh, it was crazy. You know, just the energy there, and you know, it's just we don't have another professional sports team. So the thunder, it's it's highly appreciated and people are very much into it. You know, it's just, it's a great thing for sure. Yeah. That's good to hear. Like normally they put up a new team and uh, they suck for a good, you know, 10, 15 years, but you guys, uh, yeah, they're one of the best teams in the NBA. And uh, yeah, it's good to hear that, you know, it's gentrifying everything. Everything's working out. Um, I have friends in Seattle that were mad that, you know, they took the team from Seattle and moved them there, but Hey, you got to get your own team, you know? So. Oh, my God, I was going back and forth on Twitter with this guy from Seattle who was so <laughs> angry about the Thunder. So whenever I would tweet something about a Thunder victory or something, he would say something sarcastic about, you know, uh, Oklahoma City ripping off Seattle. And, and I think I tweeted something like, you know, you had grunge and Starbucks in the 90s, you know, give someone else a chance, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, it's our uh, turn now, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, it's great. The singer for Suicide, Alan Vega, I ended up in a shovel with him at a festival a couple of years ago. And I was going to start talking about music in a real fan 
fanboy way. Cool. He starts, you know, I told him I was in the swing your lips, and all he cared to say was that he was really excited about Oklahoma City having such a great basketball yeah. team. <laughs> <laughs> the guy from Suicide, really nice. <laughs> Yeah, Alan Vega, you think would want to talk about, like, killing yourself or, you know, shooting dope. You know, he's like, man, you guys got a great basketball team. They're really excited about it. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? That's yeah. awesome. I like when you when you think something and then you you get the opposite, but it's still cool, you know? Oh, yeah, it was just, I, was, I was floored, you know, but I was also very happy about it, yeah. So, yeah. All right, so you guys uh, got the new album, The Terror, coming out April 2nd. And uh, how about any new inspirations that you guys are adding to the Flaming Lips booyah bass, if you will? You mean as far as just uh, the live show or in general? Or um, just... Kind of in general, I guess, like uh, like bands that you, you, you previously weren't really tapped into that now might you, you might feel a little bit of that listening to The Terror. I don't know. Huh? I don't know. Hard to say, you know. It's like you know, when you've been making records for so long, it's it's hard to, at least for me, stay inspired. And of course, I'm I'm still interested in new music, and I want to hear music that like you know the youngsters are doing, you know. But you feel like as you get older, like am I just getting old and irrelevant? Well, maybe I am, but you know, I think we still want to try to make a record that we were excited to make, and at least do something that we thought was different for us. And I hope the fans hear it that way. I mean, sometimes we'll think we've done some radical shift and our friends will hear and be like, yeah, it doesn't you know, seem like that big of a left turn to you guys, you know. But I hope that people hear it as, as something different for us. And uh, as we speak, Wayne's building, designing a new, with the, with the crew guys, he's designing a new stage. And it looks, we were rehearsing this weekend with the new stage. It looks incredible. It just, it looks even more futuristic and <laughs> I think it's going to suit the music more than the colors and stuff we had before. So I really hope people come and you know check us out again this year. Is what I'm, is what I'm saying. Not to sound like June Simmons or something. You know? <laughs> we're really, we're really doing some incredible things now, and everyone should uh, come be a part of it. I don't, want, you know, I don't want to sound like that, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I have to say, yeah. Really cool. Um, like you guys, you started out with the lips. Um, just playing the drums on the rec- on the recordings, right? And then a uh, couple albums in, you started playing uh, like every instrument under the sun, correct? Well, yeah, I guess I even the first record I was on, I, I played guitar and some keyboards and stuff. But as it went, yeah, I got more involved with that. You know, for some reason, whatever whatever song ideas I would come up with, they seemed to jive with what Wayne was wanting to do. You know, so. I was encouraged pretty pretty early on to contribute to the songwriting and stuff like that. But yeah, but it's evolved from there, certainly. Yeah, yeah. How about like your first memory of meeting Wayne and Mike? Well, it's funny. My first memory was I'd I'd moved to Norman from Austin. I was in a band that wasn't really doing anything. And um, I met Wayne because he was recording. The guy I was living with at the time had an eight-track studio, and the Lips had done some demos for Hit to Death in the Future Head. Nice. Wayne came over and we started. When I met him and I was super fan at that time. You know, I loved the Flaming Lips. They're like my top five favorite bands right then. And uh, we started talking about music. And people don't believe me, but this is true. I just learned how to play "Hello, It's Me" by Todd Rundgren. I, I <laughs> nice. just learned the chords. And he mentioned that song just out of the blue. Yeah. Like how much he liked that song. I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" So I grabbed the guitar and I strummed the chords for him. I think that impressed him, even though he didn't know who I was. I think he was like. It was this weird dude, but hey, he knows those chords, you know. And so two weeks later, he came back over, and in the meantime, in the meantime, he'd seen a videotape of me playing with the band I was in, playing drums. And during that time, Nathan, their drummer, had quit. So the second time he came over, we started talking, and he asked me if I wanted to join the group, and that was it. Boom. So, so yeah. it's like a perfect storm of all these things happening at once, kind of. So it was great. Yeah, I mean, I, the woman I'm married to now who changed my life. I met her and. September of 91 and then a month later I met Wayne and Michael and those are the you know, the most important things that shaped my adulthood you know all happened within a couple of months of each other you know? 91 was a great year not only for you but for the whole world it seems yeah it was good it was a good music year everything yeah but then you know I was in the band for a month before Michael and I ever had one conversation I was like <laughs> I was actually scared of him because he didn't really say much you know he's I a skinny dude in like, the corner right <laughs> yeah just smoking a lot of cigarettes he's got the sunglasses on at midnight you know I was like who is this guy you know and then he finally opened up to me after about a month of being in the band and that that was great but uh, yeah it was just you know it was a trip you know when you meet not only you're meeting people that you admire and you love their music and there's this mystery about them. Not only do you get to meet them, then they ask you to join them, you know, a couple of weeks later. It was kind of mind boggling, you know. That's really cool. Yeah. Was like the first work with them were you just playing shows or was it studio stuff? It was playing shows. Yeah, they 
you know, Nathan, the drummer, and Jonathan Downey, who had the guitar player, had left to form Mercury Road. And so they just made this record. It was just finished, and those two guys quit. So they were scrambling to get a band together because they, I think they had some shows coming up pretty soon, and they didn't know what they were going to do. So they grabbed me, and then we did a show like a month later in uh, Noble, Oklahoma, at this little hole-in-the-wall club just to see what it was like. And, and for me, it, you know, just the excitement was, man, it was just, you know, I was 22 years old. I joined like one of my favorite bands. It was just intense. You know, it was that for a couple of years, I was a couple of years. I was just high on that, just that experience. You know, it was great. That's awesome. Did you guys ever play with Mercury Rev or was it kind of like a, uh, not cool feeling between them or I don't, I haven't read about that. I'm not sure. Well, I think people wanted there to be like a negative vibe between the two bands, you know, but really, a couple of years later, I think uh, Wayne and Jonathan had started corresponding. And then, you know, Dave Fridman, who produces Mercury Rev and Flaming Lips, and who was a member of Mercury Rev, you know, he produced our record in 1995 uh, with us. So by then, there was not much bad blood. And then we toured with Mercury Rev in 1999. We did a full tour with them in Europe, and there was no there was no animosity at all, you know. And we've worked with them since. And I think people like there to be more of a story than there actually is, mm -hmm. and that's understandable, you know. Sure. But there's really not. There's not really much of a story. Jonathan wanted to leave and do his own thing because everyone knows the Flaming Lips is Wayne's band, you know. Whatever you're doing in the band, even someone like me, I'm very involved in all the music and stuff. You know, at the end of the day, it's really it's still Wayne's band, you know. I just happen to, you know, he just happens to like what I bring into the band, so I get to do a lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> I think Jonathan just wanted to go do his own thing, but it was not much more than that, really. You know, so yeah. Speaking about the leadership of Wayne, it's not something like, you know, Billy Corgan, I'm a fan of Billy Corgan, but a lot of people get on his case for being, you know, that super Svengali, it's it's my way or the highway thing. Um, I feel like Wayne would be a little bit more easygoing in that and more collaborative with, with his other group members. Is that correct? Or? Well, the thing about Wayne is, is, is people perceive him as being this sort of like my way or the highway kind of guy. He's also the kind of guy that you can be completely truthful with. I get the feeling with Billy Corgan, if you told him that you didn't like his guitar part, he would just fire you, you know? <laughs> sure, yeah. With Wayne, you could say, I don't know about the guitar part, and be like, well, what, he would want to know what you had to say. He wouldn't just dismiss it, you know? Or if you said, well, I don't like this thing we're doing, he wouldn't just say, well, fuck you, you're an idiot. He'd say, well, tell me, tell me what you want to tell me, and then let's move from there. It's not really, there's a give and take with Wayne. Nice. Uh, obviously there is with me, or I wouldn't have been be in the band for 21 years now. It would just be miserable, you know. So I don't really, he's not that, he doesn't seem that way to me. And as much as he might seem like a blowhard, he's also the guy, the kind of guy that if you call him at 4 o'clock in the morning and your car was broken down, you know, uh, 180 miles away, he would get in his car right then and drive <laughs> and go help you out. Billy Corgan would hire someone to go do it for him. So there's a difference there, you know. That is really cool. That makes me like Wayne even more. Um, yeah, so starting yeah. out, your your early drumming sensibilities were, were based on polka, country, all sorts of stuff. Um, did you ever have the urge to, uh, like, incorporate that polka? I've heard that, like, bad religion and all that punk stuff, they call it punk polka. You know, this, that dun 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 the whole album. Beat. Yeah, it's the yeah, same it's beat. Yeah, it's the same beat. Like, hardcore and polka music are really closely related, the rhythm for the drummer, you know? Sure. To me, it's like the, I guess the thing I got from polka was, and maybe oversimplifying it, was learning to not play a bunch of fills, because when I was 11, I wanted to play rock rock fills, but you can't do that in a polka band. And I had these guys in their forties going, "Look, kid, you can't be fucking playing your, you know, your uh, Neil Peart <laughs> kind of stuff with these polka and, and waltz music that we're playing." So if anything, I think it kind of taught me to just sometimes play the beat, you know. But I don't really hear any, any of the polka music influence so much in the music I've made with the Flaming Lips, you know. It's no. really just a sensibility of not overplaying. And then you go the other way where, you know, the flashiness of Keith Moon are like Bill Ward's drum fills, which are just really, you know, they're just intense and they're almost like their own melodies or something in a way, especially Keith Moon, you know? Sure. And I guess by the time I joined the lips, I just really, you know, everybody who's a drummer at 21 or most of them want to be John Bonham, and I certainly did. So, and I still discover stuff in this plane that like, oh my God, you know, I can't <laughs> believe he was doing those kinds of beats when he was 22 and he didn't have... 30 years of rock history to draw upon you know he had like five years of rock history and then like some jazz guys and then just his own fucking intuition or whatever you know it's a for a guy playing like john bonham today that's nothing because he's got 40 years of history you know john bonham had nothing to draw on so i'm still pretty pretty uh flabbergasted by john bonham now 
Yeah, when I first heard your drumming, when I first heard, you know, transmissions in 93, I said, oh, gosh, this is going to be huge. It sounds like Bonham, you know, playing behind uh, Sonic Youth or Butthole Surfers. And that's what that's what they needed. You know, they need that muscular power rock beat, you know, behind them to really put them forward. You know, well, I'm glad you heard that. Yeah, because uh, I mean, we consciously were trying to do that, you know, trying to mix because. You know, all the guys in Flaming Lips are as much a Led Zeppelin fan as I am in the production of Led Zeppelin and stuff. And, and even though some people think it's just simple hard rock, you know, with Led Zeppelin, there's so much more to it than that. And we were always trying to get, you know, some more of the production elements out of it. So, yeah, I'm glad you heard that. You know, that's definitely what we were trying to do. So, yeah. How about, like, the first memory of seeing, like, she don't use jelly on MTV, and uh, what kind of feeling did that give you? Or- See, the first time, I'm um, trying to think of where we were. I think we may have been in Buffalo, New York on a day off on tour, I think. And, you know, back then, you know, we can't really explain it to a 21-year-old now because MTV is just really nothing now, you know? Sure, yeah. And everyone has the Internet, so, you know, they can't understand the cultural significance of MTV in the, still in the early 90s, you know, how big of a deal it was. It just felt like, just for a little while, like, hey, we might be big rock stars. Let's see what happens here, you know. And then a month later, we're still doing what we were doing before. And, you know, a year later, it took a little while before it seemed to trickle down into life-changing kind of stuff where all of a sudden we were playing for bigger money. We were playing to bigger crowds, you know. At the time, it was just, it was a blip, but it was very exciting just to see yourself on TV, you know. So I don't know. That's my memory of it, you know. That's about it. And Wayne's wife was in that video, and he's still married to her, right? That's right. Yeah, Michelle. That was his, uh, you know, his model. He anytime he wanted to, you know, get a hot chick in a video, he was just a kid. Okay, Michelle, go get those clothes and <laughs> go over here, and then she would be in the video. And then the Turn It On video with the three girls with laundromat. One of those is my wife, Becky. We're still oh. married to this day as well. So. If you watch the Turn It On video, there's three women. There's uh, Wayne's wife, Michelle. Then there's Emma, who's a friend of ours. And then Becky is the dark-haired one at the laundromat. That's my wife. So she made it, she made it into one of our videos as well. <laughs> That's really awesome. How long you got? Oh, yeah, you said 91 you guys got married? Yeah. No, no, we met in 91. Oh. We didn't actually get married until 2004, but oh. we met in 1991. Oh, nice. <laughs> it took some doing. You know, I had to live through the grungeified 90s. You know, I had sure. some problems that I had to get past. But, <laughs> you had to work out your yeah, demons. Yeah. yeah. Work out my demons. But, you know, now we've been married for, we got two kids, and yeah, everything's good. So, yeah. How about the follow up album, uh, Cloud Taste Metallic? Was there a lot of, you know, uh, the Warner Brothers suits, you know, drinking Pepto Bismol, breathing down your neck, trying to tell you, you need, we need another hit? <laughs> I love that. I love the uh, the imagery of them drinking Pepto Bismol. <laughs> and they've all got like you know they're all in suits and they all have like these little hand towels because they're wiping their brow because they're sweating you know. And they're Cigarette the holders, yeah. Yeah, and we're playing you know we're playing uh, the beginning of like they puncture my yolk and they're just like oh, ah, uh, we really we need a hit here, guys. Um, you know there was a little bit of that you know because I think that the thing with Warner Brothers is now we've owned them so long. We have this mutual understanding where they don't give us too much money, but they don't expect too much from us. They just let us basically do what we want, which how great is that, you know, that, sure. you know, we've been basically uh, connected to Warner Bros. since 1991 or 90, actually, because they signed before I was in the band. But um, I think with Cause Case Metallic, there was an expectation that, you know, she don't use Jolly was kind of a hit. It wasn't a mega hit. Can you guys sort of do something in a similar vein? We want you to be quirky or the kind of weirdo alternative guys, you know, sure. there's a little bit of that. And, you know, we just, we, we couldn't guarantee that. We didn't, it felt like we were actively fighting against it. We just didn't know really how to do that or what it would be. But in some ways, I think Cause Taste Metallic sounds like the next record after the band that made you know, East Jelly. To me, they sound like similar things, you similar. know. Sure. But uh, the thing was, after that record did not sell at all, you know, when all these bands were getting dropped in the mid to late 90s, from like 96 to 98, you know, we were up there kind of on the chopping block, like, what are we going to do with these guys, you know? And it seemed like we just kind of fell under the radar right at the right time when all these bands were getting dropped. And at the same time, Scott Booker, our manager, and Wayne convinced Warner Brothers to give us one budget to make one proper record, and then, you know, what whatever Zyrica was, you know, four discs, you know, to be played yeah. simultaneously. <laughs> And here's a band that only sold 20,000 copies of their last record. 
but they wanted to give him money to make four discs to be played at the same time. You could see the guy sweating, and he does want to go big mall, you know. <laughs> but then, you know, the Salt Bulletin was like a kind of a critical hit. It's like, well, yeah, it gave us a whole new lease on life with Warner Brothers. I, I guess really the world in general, you know. It's like we just got a whole new fresh start on those. You know? And Warner so, Brothers pretty- feels like, like a major you can trust just because they proved themselves with R.E.M., you know, for 15 years. They they never gave them the hit they wanted, yet they, they were popular, but they never gave them, like, that hit they wanted, and they, they keep the interesting, you know? And so, like, Warner Brothers uh, sticking with R.E.M. so long, I feel like they do have the artist back in a certain way. Well, I feel like I don't have experience with other record companies, but that's certainly been our experience with one. And the Chili they, Peppers, right? Yeah. Well, the Chili Peppers have had hits since 1988 or, <laughs> yeah. or 90 or whatever. So that's not like, oh, this is a critical, you know, luckily they're, you know. They're it's not, not the not Melvins. Like it's a financial yeah. struggle. It's not the Melvins, you know. <laughs> We're somewhere in between. But I just think they got to a point where, you know, it, we weren't selling solo records. It was a total loss. And we got, you know, a year, enough years went by where it's like, oh, this Flaming Lips band, they've been around for a long time, and they've been on Warner Bros. for a long time. So I think the kind of thought is that we were almost like, you know, attractive to younger bands looking at major labels because we'd been given such free reign with our with our own career, you know. So, But, it, you know, it worked out great for all of us. You know, I can't speak for other bands and other labels, but certainly the Flaming Lips and Warner Bros., that's just a great... You know, great relationship we've had with them. But, yeah, it was dicey for a couple of years there in the in the mid-90s. But yeah, it's, they, it's weird they, that the whole the whole zeitgeist worked out because I read a book about, on Sonic Youth, and, like, David Geffen would keep giving Thurston Moore these raises, even though they sold, like, 20,000 records. He kept giving them the raises because Thurston Moore was, like, the ear to the streets. You know, he was finding Beck, finding all these bands and signing them to Geffen, and, like – being a conduit of the talent, not exactly being the hit band, but being a conduit of all these new bands, you know? Absolutely, yeah. But Thurston Moore, you know, Thurston Moore and Sonic Youth, they are like their own, that's just its own entity. There's nothing like <laughs> Sonic Youth on the planet, you know? I mean, I I went through a period where I was like, yeah, Sonic Youth, I don't care about them anymore. But then I realized, you know, that I thought their last couple of records were as good as, or I liked them as much as the records I liked in the mid to late 80s, you know? Sure. Just the the fact that they existed was just a wonderful thing, you know. So if I had been David Geffen, I would have just given Thurston more cash to Thurston <laughs> sure. more. I would have been fine with that, you know. So, yeah. <clears throat> How about this, like the first album where kind of the drugs got in the way a little bit? Well, I was already doing drugs by the time we were doing Cloud Space Metallic, but they didn't yeah. really start to get in the way until we were And I just mean hard drugs, weekend. too. Like, yeah. Yeah, I started getting into hard stuff about uh, mid-95, so, you know, but it became really a problem by the time we started working on Zyreka and Soft Bullets and stuff, because that's, you know, some of the stuff on Soft Bullets and we actually recorded in 97 before, you know, even Zyreka came out. And so I was getting to the point where I was still able to do a lot of music and, and play music and think music and create but really, by 99, 2000, it started to get to a point where, you know, if I didn't have my drugs, there was not, I really couldn't do much, you know. Yeah. I could barely play a show, and I certainly didn't want to get up and go to my four track and work on music, you know. I, won't, I only would do that when I was high, and then it got to a point where when I got high, I didn't want to do it either, you know. <laughs> so people don't understand that. They've never gotten into that cycle. It's like at first, you, you think it's fueling your creativity, but what's happening is, at least for me, it was freeing my mind of stress and worry, like opiate drugs do that for me, where it makes me not worry about the things I was worried about. So now I'm free to make music, you know, and it starts out that way. But after four or five years, you get to a point where if you don't have it, you're just fucking, you're, you can't do anything, you know, and it, it totally robs you of any creativity because all your energy is spent trying to score and not be sick, you know. So, yeah. Hey, what was the straw that uh, broke the camel's back, if you, if you mind me asking? Well, let's see, I got to a point in the fall of 2001 where I was, man, I was ready, to, I wanted to do something because I knew if things kept going the way they were going, I was either going to be in jail or dead or the hospital with something terrible that hadn't happened, you know. I got to the end of my rope. I was living in this house with no electricity. I mean, we were a touring band. I made a lot of money in those mm-hmm. couple of years, but I had nothing, you know, it all went to my stuff. And, and Wayne and I were going to the studio, and I showed up like three hours late because I was waiting to score. And I was to this point, he was just fucking pissed off. He was so angry. I got in our little rented minivan with our equipment, and he just fucking freaked out on me, you know. He just started yelling, screaming, like, hit me, you know. He almost started crying. He was just so upset, you know. 
and then I got really upset, and so we had this little blow-up that lasted about 10 minutes in the car. And after that, I said, look, I've made up my mind. I'm going to try to stay in New York for a while and just get myself together. Not New York City, but New York, like western New York, way out in the woods, you know, gotcha. for the studio where there's nothing to be had that I knew of. And I just ended up staying there. I stayed at Michael Ivan's bass player's house for a little while with him and his wife, and I got through the worst of it over a couple of months. And then, you know, just over the next couple of years, you know, everything that I wanted to try to do that was positive just seemed to work out, you know. And, you know, Yoshin really took off and gave us a whole other level of success. And all these things just kind of lined up where whatever I wanted to try to change my life, it, it happened and it was positive. So it kept me from going back to what it had been before. And I could see how these guys, they try to quit, but the only people they know are drug addicts and they don't have a career to speak of or people that love them. I could see how they fall back into that because it's hard enough when everything is going right for you to stay away from it, you know? Yeah. But um, everything went right for me, you know, because my girlfriend and I had broken up. That's Becky. And we got, she decided to give me another chance because I quit drugs and, you know, we got engaged and got married and had kids. And for years, I just kept on this sort of uh, this wave of good things happening with the band and, you know, with my life. The upward spiral. So, yeah. I yeah, like it was an upward spiral. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, but I'm thankful because if things had gone into the way, like I said, if I didn't have friends and family and people that wanted to see me do well, it could really be a struggle, you know. But I didn't. I had a great support group of people that didn't do drugs. So it was. That made it a lot more doable, you know. So, yeah, I feel yeah. like if if Wayne and Mike didn't have the love for you, they could have just you know sacked you, and that could have been the end for you. But that's it's really the, the power of the brotherhood within the band that kind of saved your life. It seems like. Absolutely, yeah. Because really, they're like my older brothers. I have two older brothers, and they're both they're both dead now. I mean, one of them died in nineteen. That's too much personal information. But I have two older brothers that had passed away, and. And they're about the same age as Wayne and then Michael. So it's like they're kind of like my two older brothers that I miss, but now I have them, except for Wayne and Michael didn't steal and, you know, do drugs and go to prison and stuff like that. So there were like two older brother role models that I always kind of looked up to in that way. So absolutely, that made a really big difference in my life for sure. That's really cool. Very inspiring. I don't want to keep it too much longer. I just got like maybe one or two more here. I feel like you yeah. guys are big like music fans, and I feel that throughout your entire career, um, especially with the full album cover of Dark Side on the Moon. Did you ever hear from like uh, like Roger Waters or David Gilmore? I wish. No, we never heard anything from no. those guys. There's just a few people that would be really floored to meet, you know. Um, Who would that be, if you mind me asking? Well, David Gilmore would actually be in there. I had a chance to meet him one time, but I didn't. I didn't approach him. Um, if I ever met Jimmy Page, I would flip out. <laughs> Uh, I met Robert Plant. That wasn't that big of a deal. But I feel like meeting Jimmy Page, I would really lose it because to me, he's just like one of the great wizards of all music of all time, you know? Sure. Keith yeah. Richards, I got to hug him one time. There was a big photo opportunity at this Stars Business that we played in Toronto. I thought I wouldn't care. And he walked up and just for some reason, he singled me out of all the group, all the musicians there and he grabbed me and hugged me because, how you going, man? I almost started crying. I was just Damn. freaking out. <laughs> It was it was beautiful. I don't know. Uh, that's your question. I never heard from Roger Waters and David Gilmore. But, you know, I get bummed out because I think all these classic rock dudes, the only guys they know about are like fucking Jack White and like Dave Grohl. You know, that's the only people that represent like younger musicians that they know about. To them, you know? yeah. <laughs> to them, you know. And I love Jack White. He's very talented, but... You know, there's this whole world of music. I wonder if Jimmy Page has ever heard somebody like, you know, Tame Impala. And, like, what would he think about a group like Tame Impala, you know? Or Kurt Vile or something, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I just wonder if they get to hear that stuff. So sometimes I'm like, because uh, Jimmy Page's daughter is a photographer, and we met her once. She said that he really liked the riff to the wand. And we were like, oh, my God, he likes, you know, I wish we could, you know, we wanted to do something with him. Really bad. I mean, yeah, he made that whole record with Black Crows, you know. Sure, they could do something with us, but... I don't know. He's just at the top of the heap. There was just a few guys, you know, really. When I met the Sonic Youth guys, we played some shows with them a few years ago. I couldn't I couldn't even approach them. I was just too nervous to even say anything. Really? So Wayne's over there, like, giving Thurston shit about his shoes or something. And I'm like, I can't even approach this guy. He's like a god to me, you know. So, I don't know. Like, I'm completely irreverent about it. And at the same time, I'm totally irreverent about it. Does that make sense? You know? I understand. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty funny. 
How about like a favorite album of 2012 that or that you've been into? I mean, I I had to sit through the Grammy Awards last night, and uh, that was quite an ordeal. You know, I I I, uh, I had the guy who writes the Grammys on my show, David Wilde. He's a nice guy, but uh, as far as the talent they have on there, I, it's it's tough these days. You know. So. Well, the, yeah, the Grammys. That's just uh, I don't know, man. I. I hate to be the, the old timer, yeah. but uh, I just, uh, you know, Justin Bieber or whoever, it's like, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't care, you know. Here's, um, here's, here's my favorite of 2012, while you think. Um, mine was by an old legend that I got to see for the first time last November, Neil Young and Crazy Horse. His, his uh, psychedelic pill double album was incredible, mm-hmm. and he's stretching out on there. The first song is 30 Minutes. And, uh, you know, no, no overdubs. He's just got weird lyrics, you know, crazy guitar sounds and totally heartfelt. So Neil Young's album was on the top of my list and I'm reading his well, book now and it's awesome as well. So, well, he's one of the few, he's, he's one of the gods still walking the earth. You know, I mean, if you think about how long he's been around and all the things he's done and yeah. how he still cares about young people making music and young people listening to music and, youth culture and the energy of, you know, you know, all that stuff. It's just incredible that someone like him is still walking around doing this thing, you know. We got to meet him when we played a bridge school benefit oh, uh, cool. back a few months ago. So, um, but I don't know, for 2012, but I like that group Peaking Lights. Had their, I didn't like their last record as much as the first record that I heard, but, and then I'm like, uh, Kane and Paul is probably, I'm probably their biggest fan. I sure. Kane and Paul from Australia that one does right now, but, you know, I was into him three years ago. So I'm not some Johnny come lately, you know, right. I liked them three years ago, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just always looking for people that, you know, guys in their early twenties that are making records, but I'm still waiting to be like, you know, like Pink Floyd must have been in 1977. Our yes must have been in 1977 <laughs> when they heard the clash. Oh, they must sure. have felt like, oh my God, what? Oh my God! All of a sudden, what? What is this that's happening? We, I don't know what. I don't understand. You know, I wish something like that would happen. Maybe, maybe dubstep is that. I'm just not accepting it. I, I don't know. You know, but I wish I could hear some music that just blows my mind and makes me feel like I'm really old. But I haven't really heard it yet. So that's what I'm waiting for. You know, it's coming down the line <laughs> in a couple of years. You know, so surely, right? I mean, come on. How about like the next or the first single off the terror? When are we going to hear that? I know we heard the Super Bowl commercial last week. Um, when's that first Which single? Is nothing. Gonna... That's nothing like the record. That is nothing, nothing like. Yeah. If people think, oh, I can't wait to hear the new record. This band, the Flaming Lips. I heard that Super Bowl commercial. If they get a new record, if they get to me like that, they're going to want to return the record. I will <laughs> tell you that now because there's no correlation between the two. <laughs> so, I think the first thing we're going to pick will be the song, the terror. I think that's what we're looking at now, but I'm not sure. So. Cool. It's, I've heard Wayne call it a heroin new wave or the dark side of new wave. To me, it's like it's like suicide or Spaceman Three meets Ooh, nice. like uh, meets Popple Bug, <laughs> uh, that German prog band that had these crazy choir things. You know, that's I don't know, or like the darker side of new wave or something. But uh, it's my favorite record we've done in a long time, so I'm I'm really excited about it. So we'll see very awesome. Say. I think that's a beautiful place to end on. Uh, there you go. Love chatting with you. Thanks for taking the time out of your day, man. Yeah, stay, stay in touch with me on Twitter, okay? For sure. So they can find right. you at Stephen Drozd on Twitter, right? That's right. You got and it, yeah. what is it, theflaminglips.com, flaminglips.com? I don't know. You, you can do that or just do the Flaming Lips Twitter, you know, at the Flaming Lips, and then mine's just at Stephen Drozd. So, you're, yeah. you're at the point where they can just Google you, you know? <laughs> exactly, that's true, for good or bad. So, yeah. One any, more time? Any last words before we uh, break up here? Um, go get our new record, The Terror. It's out April 2nd. You're going to love it. It's the best thing we've ever done. Awesome. So on behalf of Stephen Droz, this is Andy Dare <laughs> signing off for the Andy Dare Show. Be sure to follow Andy on Twitter. That's at Andy Dare, A-N-D-Y-D-E-R-E-R. And like our show on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash The Andy Dare Show. Video is at YouTube.com slash Andrew Martin Dare. And it all leads back to the TheAndyDareShow.com. Support our show by supporting our sponsors. Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue, secondhand mall, the Mandrate, and Amazon.com. Thank you so much for listening.